if I just sort of set the set the stall out, you can take up your own tale. You, you were approached by Barbara Castle, then a very prominent Labour MP in the 1980s, I presume, and 84, yeah. 1984, and she gave you documents and asked you to look into their contents. That's right, yes. Yeah, she was, um, I, I was editor of the local paper there. Um, I knew Barbara from several years before. I used to work with the BBC and had interviewed her before. Um, and when I went to the newspaper, she became our local Euro MP. So it was a good relationship that continued. Uh, we used to meet up quite regularly every Friday and just have a chat about putting the world to rights. And, you know, gradually she came to me and said, you know, I don't suppose you'd be interested in this and started to feed me some information and bring in some, some documents. And, you know, it was quite explosive, really, in terms of what she was showing me here, um, that there was a, you know, a, a paedophile ring uh, operating within uh, the, the powers of Westminster, and that many of the members were actively supporting the, the PI network, the paedophile information exchange network. Um, and I find it quite amazing. And she, she gradually came in with more and more papers. Do, do we know where she was getting the documents from? Then? Yeah, she got contacted within the House and uh, they were feeding information to her. She'd obviously been an MP for donkey's years, yes. really, but had sort of left there, quit, and, and gone as a Euro MP. But she still kept in touch with them. And a lot of her contacts were feeding her really you know, serious information here about people that were meddling in, in the Pine Network. And the aim, really, was to try and get a, enough support within Westminster to make it uh, legal to have sex with children. And she was absolutely appalled by this and wanted to uh, obviously put a stop to it. And the dossier that Geoffrey Dickinson had given to Leon Britton, do you think that that examined similar territory? Do you think some of the stuff that Barbara Castle got her hands on may have been contained within that original dossier? I, I'm we... absolutely positive it would have done. I mean, she came to me probably about six months or so after the, uh, the Dickens right. report had come through. So I wasn't too clued up, to be, to be honest, about the Dickens thing, because it was all sort of fairly confidential in those days. Um, but she must have seen that. Um, she had an absolute wad of documents. She came in one day with uh, a briefcase, absolutely chocker with, with information, photographs and uh, all sorts of things. She gave me a limited amount of paperwork, which was enough to perhaps run a story and asked if I would do it. And I said, well, the only way I can do it is on the back of, uh, you, you know, in fact, you're doing it as the local uh, your MP. Yes. You're, you're instigating this, this uh, inquiry. And I think what she had mainly was intelligence about a second inquiry that maybe Lee and Britton uh, had instigated in terms of looking into the Dickens dossier. Because I think this, the timing was, was probably about right in terms of maybe six, six months, nine months after that had been uh, uh, registered. And so I think there was a second inquiry going on within Westminster to see who may have been involved in all this. And plenty of the paperwork she gave me involved... Uh, minutes of meetings, um, uh, copies of meetings, uh, people, French meetings, really, within Westminster, people who were supporting the Pi Network. There was a lot from the National Council of Civil Liberties and things that were involved as well. Um, but there were a number of people that were listed as actively promoting and supporting the Pi Network to actually provide speakers from the Pi Network at fringe meetings. And these politicians were named in, in these documents? Yeah, the, a lot of them were named. Uh, I mean, obviously, I cannot remember all the names sure. now, but there, was, there were two specific lists. One was a list of 16 active MPs and peers that were involved with this. Um, another was a list of about 30 people who were supporters. There were uh, mention of um, heads of private schools or the teachers or involved with scout groups and organisations from the church and things like that that were, again, funding and actively supporting this. Um, and you know, various MPs were named in sort of, if you want to get a speaker finder, contact uh, Rhodes Boyston, for instance. He was... Uh, it somehow involved with the distribution of the uh, Magpie magazine, which was the Pie uh, magazine. And there were copies of, of um, adverts that were flagged up here where they were openly uh, promoting open weekends at different public schools for boys and things. And different events, in, in, mainly involving uh, children and boys, were flagged up as, as something that's worthy of, uh, of note. Um, there, was, there was an awful lot of, of information in there um, it was too much information in a sense to run one story. It would have you know, probably went to saga. But Barbara had said to me she'd been to national newspapers and they weren't interested. They do wouldn't you, touch it with a barge pole. Do you know why? That. Did she say why? What reasons was she given? It was too sensitive. Good Lord. Um, they'd been frightened off. And, uh, and uh, Don, let me stop you there, because the, the, as you know better than anyone, the news waits for none of us and it is approaching the 12 noon hour. So we'll, we'll take the very latest bulletin for 
Britain and then return to Don Hale. We left Don just as the dossiers he'd been handed by the... At the time, she was a member of the European Parliament. Barbara Castle, of course, previously Secretary of State for, for Employment and for Social Services, I think, had handed him as a, as a journalistic friend a succession of files containing very, very serious allegations about very, very prominent people. She had tried to give them to national newspaper journalists and been sort of turned away on the grounds that everything was a little bit too sensitive, a little bit too close, perhaps, to the bone. And so she turned to her friend in Derbyshire, Don Hale. Don, what happened next? Well... It was a mass of documents that I had. I had to try and put things together and get it into context. I didn't actually read every single thing that was given to me, but there was enough evidence there, information, uh, naming names, to contact the Home Office and to contact some of the, the key names mentioned to, just to get a response. Um, now, when I phoned the, the Home Office, um, it was obviously very different to what it is now. You were dealing with certain departments that were very aggressive to, to journalists. All they wanted to know, they refused to answer any questions and tried to turn it back on myself to ask, well, who's giving you this information? Where have you got it from? How have you got access to this information, etc., etc.? And it was very similar whenever I contacted any of the personalities involved with that. Eventually, um, I was told then by the, the Liberal organisation that somebody would, would come and basically put me right. They would come and uh, talk to me about this. And Cyril Smith turned up the, the very next day on, on my doorstep. Uh, at home or at the office? At the office. So Cyril yeah. Smith, MP for Rochdale at the time, turns yeah. up personally yeah. on your doorstep as a direct result of questions you'd been asking about the contents of these dossiers. These That's files. right, and he was very, very aggressive. And I, I actually had interviewed him several times before. Um, I thought of him as... I mean, he was a bit of a renter quote, they used to say, in those days. <laughs> we all need those, Don. We all need those. We do. <laughs> um, and I was going with him very, very well before that. But within 10 seconds of him arriving, he went from Mr Nice Guy to Mr Nasty, was, was really threatening and aggressive. Um, you know, he was a big guy anyway, but he was really pointing fingers, banging on the desk and demanding I hand over all these papers to him. Well, there's no way I was going to do that. I was saying, you know, this is the uh, start of my inquiries, and I wanted a response to that. He refused to give a response, eventually stormed out. Um, the next thing I had was the following day, a um, special branch arrived with a gang of policemen. And they, again, wanted uh, or demanding access to the files. They wanted to take everything away, making all sorts of threats and saying, if, you know, if, was I prepared to hand them the files? And I was asking, well, what, for what reason? And that, they say, you know, that's for us to know. It is not in the public interest. It, it's a threat, potential threat to national security. You have to hand these files to us. Are you prepared to do so? If you don't, we'll arrest you on the spot and you could face two years in jail. Now, I was in possession here, uh, if, if you recall, of some very sensitive documents. Some of these have got actually not to be removed from the Home Office or for your eyes only, confidential documents. So I was bound to write in that respect, whereas, you know, as a journalist, I got yeah. very sensitive uh, papers here. So you couldn't object to that. They've got a search warrant anyway. Uh, their officers uh, got all the files. I was asked to say, is this everything that's come forward? And I had to say yes, and they, they took them all away and disappeared. Now, when I phoned Barbara later in the day to say about this, I said, you never guess what's, what's just happened. And she said, oh, I half expected that. I thought something like that might happen. And I was absolutely gobsmacked because I thought, well, I wish you'd told me <laughs> because yes. I might have been able to do something about it. But again, when you think back, you think, well, if I had copied files um, and I'd given a word or assurance to them that they'd had everything and I still published a, a story, I could still be in serious trouble. Of course you could. And it's worth remembering that... that they would be a security risk. If the allegations within them were true, it would expose every single person mentioned to, to, to blackmail by, by foreign powers or by just about anybody. Did you see the revelations in the Sunday People this weekend, Don, about the former deputy director of MI6 being... Yes, that's right, yes, I did see some I mean, of that. You, you, you must be hearing a lot of bells ring at the moment as this... Well, I mean, the strange thing with this, since I sort of broke the story about the Barber Castle a few months ago, hmm. I've, I've been want really with MPs coming on to me, people who are ex-security services, special branch, flying squad, etc., police officers at the Met, all giving me information about where these files are probably uh, are, that everyone knew one this was going to be an absolute waste of time. Not Why do you fault. say that? Why do you say that? Because he was given um, Mission Impossible. He was given a brief that was impossible to follow. He was just really reviewing a review that had failed 12 months more ago. And Do you think Theresa May was being cynical then when she appointed the chief executive of the NSPCC to, to, I, to I conduct do. that um, review of a review? I, I think he was just set up to fail on this. I don't think he had a, a hope in hell of trying to find these things. He, his, his directive was so narrow, he wasn't able to diversify. I mean, 
a lot of MPs have said that they seem quite amazed that uh, Peter Wanless and his, his team have not contacted me or contacted other people who've, who've supplied uh, uh, vital information, I would say, about this, this report. I mean, initially, we're looking into the, the Dickens dossier. Yes. Now, I think that is a little bit of a red herring nowadays because that was the start of, of this inquiry. That's what kick-started kick all 30 odd years ago. And I think that I'm sure that that's what, what Barbara Castle um, yes. you know, picked up on. But by the same token, that's probably been fragmented over the years. But I do believe parts of that report do exist, and I think they're in various archives now, probably including Barbara's own archives. But I think what it's set a chain in motion here. What is missing from this, and it, as far as I can see from what I've seen so far, the one that's report, it's not really looked into um, a, a proper paper trail. It's not really interviewed people like Liam Britton, who has now admitted having the Dickens report and passing it on to colleagues. What we want to know is who these colleagues were, what happened. Um, nobody can just walk into um, Liam Britton's office and say, here, mate, here's, here's a file, you should read this. Yes. It goes through a system in the Home Office. And there'd be a paper trail as well. There is a paper trail. What was registered? What was recorded? And this is where senior officials have told me in the last few weeks that the, the, these documents were registered. Everything was itemised uh, in, these, in these records. That paper trail still exists. You might not be able to identify all the uh, ingredients, but it will say statements from X, Y, and Z, photographs from people, other information that is relevant to, to the Dickens dossier. Um, so that is, that's the first part. That is a paper trail. And at the end of it, we, there must have been a conclusion. Liam Britton must have had a, a report back from his inquiry to say, this is what we recommend, something like you're getting now from the one list report. But I think with Barbara Castle's um, uh, inquiries here, she's obviously rattled a few cages there. The Home Office have jumped about uh, and set the special branch on to me there to try and prevent this information getting out. But again, it's evidence clear evidence that there was some sort of second inquiry going on within six to nine months after the Dickens report that Barbara knew about. And again, there must be a paper trail there and there must be a conclusion. So we've got two narratives now, Don, haven't we? We've got the increasingly irresistible conclusion or suspicion that there was a high level of, of, of sex crime unfolded against being committed against children mm. during this period by some very high level people and that that was for perfectly I suppose understandable albeit abhorrent reasons that there was a lid kept on that but yeah. now you've got the the, the 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 modern narrative of investigation in quotation marks and the question I'd ask you is whether or not you feel there is an appetite in Whitehall at the moment or in the Home Office at the moment Theresa May's statement to the House last Monday was very impressive was widely welcomed but do you feel that there is now an appetite to shine a light into the murkiest corners of this issue that that, that you are one of the few people who have already glimpsed i don't feel there's any appetite whatsoever and i mm. think it's getting harder now because you're six months away from a general election i don't think people want to rock the boat upset their own parties and i think they're all worried about their own seats so i think they'd rather sort of sit on the fence and what i'm getting back from the mps is this sort of feeling as well the ones that have, have been in contact with me They've also uh, spoken about se uh, senior uh, officials in the Home Office, uh, either current or retired, who again are worried about the Official Secrets Act being thrown at them, that they could lose the pensions, they could be exposed, and by mentioning certain names or certain parties, it could bring the whole thing into disrepute. They've not been given any assurance that if they talk to any committee or anybody else, that they will be given some sort of immunity. Because again, the people who put you up against the wall, so to speak, in your in your office from special branch, they yeah. will be legally prevented from telling their side of the story today. Well, that's right. And I mean, I spoke to John O'Connor. He's the former head of the Flying, flying Squad, squad yes. And um, a very well-respected guy. He was uh, has told me that he, he was in charge of that, that organisation. He was on notice that um, an investigation was going to come his way, and then it didn't. It didn't materialise for whatever. But he's told me... He spoke of the special branch in the 1980s as the government protection unit. They were ruthless, they were law unto themselves, and they were working for the puppet masters. Their job was to protect the, the, the political integrity, if you like, of MPs and, and the parliament. And bearing in mind at that time as well, James, that, that, that we had the Cold War going on, yes. they were worried this was a specialist unit that were trying to protect MPs of any potential... Uh, abuse allegations or uh, attempts by blackmail to reveal secrets, etc. So, again, 
this doesn't always reflect in, in modern reports, but that was quite crucial in those days. And we have, a, there's, there's, there's a footage of a whip, isn't there, a Conservative whip, saying that they would use similar allegations to get, to get Conservative MPs to, to toe the party line. Uh, that they, oh, yeah. There's that yeah, footage right. of him saying it, you know, and if there were stories involving boys, then we'd use that to put the, put the pressure yeah. on. I mean, I think with this report, I mean, when, when I... When Barbara Castle gave me this information, I contacted the Home Office, I contacted the key individuals mentioned here, as I say. I never said for one minute that Barbara Castle had given me this information. I didn't reveal my thoughts. Now, when Cyril Smith came to see me the very next day, he knew Barbara Castle had been to see me and over a period of time. And I'm absolutely convinced that Barbara Castle and other key individuals who were maybe rocking the boat at that stage were being monitored by a special branch. And that is why... Uh, they came to see me. He'd obviously reported back saying it's a waste of time. He's not going to give me the information. So they came in with the with the heavy boots. It just gets now, curiouser and curiouser, it, doesn't it? This has been almost uh, reported as well. Tony Robinson, who was a special branch operative in that in my area in, in Lancashire at that time, his job was to look, um, you know, rather he, he dealt with political uh, incidents rather than criminal incidents. Mm. And again. His job, and, and others in, in Special Branch in that time, was to look after individual MPs in sort of Liverpool, Manchester, the North West area that were liable to kick up dust. And again, it, they were there to protect the backs of these people. We've got clear evidence here that, that's come forward, Cyril Smith, for instance, of several incidents where Special Branch have, have stepped in and prevented any prosecution or further... Even when uniformed officers, uniformed officers were keen to... Continue yeah. to scrutinise oh, yeah. further, possibly even to, to, to uh, you know, investigate, bring charges. Special branch yeah. would come and put the mockers on them. Yeah, there's, there's, several, there's several recorded incidents here, and, and some that have been sort of brushed on the carpet in the Midlands area. In, in uh, Cyril Smith was uh, uh, accused of um, some offence in, in a toilet in, in the centre of, of Birmingham, and also uh, found with a car boot full of child pornography right. in Northampton. And all these incidents were sort of swept under the carpet because of the intervention of Special Branch. This was how powerful they were. Everybody was scared to death of them. And they were there simply to protect the backs of the MPs. Now, none of this is reflected in any documents that I've seen of late, um, you know, with the Cold War, with their input, etc. Mm -hmm. And again, this, this fear factor is still there. Uh, I'm convinced that certain MPs are still in power uh, here, Yes. But I think it's a party policy at the moment, almost like to hold hands and try and uh, block anything that's happening here. Because it uh, could undermine faith in the political system. Well, I think it, yeah, I think it does. Um, I think when you talk to some of the MPs now, they, they've lost confidence in their own parties in, the, in terms of the way they're being shunned a little bit. And I think they're becoming a little bit worried about uh, their own seats and whether they're actually going to be retained as MPs by parties. Where, where, where it could lead, who knows what? Who, who knows what's going to happen next? Don, I'm, I'm late for, for the travel news. I've detained you for a lot longer than you agreed to already. But what would you like to see happen next? Well, there is this next um, investigation going on. This next inquiry. The one without a chair. Yeah, currently without a head and chair and what have you. I, I would hope that they would look at all these other fringe activities. Um, we've got. I mean, I could say now where these other people have said where, where these documents are, whether it's the, mm. um, the, the main report or other subsidiary reports. But I, there is a chain that can be identified quite clearly here. They also want to look at the archives from Barbara Castle. Now, since, since I mentioned all that, a lot of them are now being blocked or closed or whatever. And people who are still in, in, in around the, the area, Jack Straw, Neil Kinnock, um, are people that have had access to this information in the past according to, to Barbara Castle. She's written to them, they've written back, and Liam written as well. These are people that we need to bring into the, uh, the debate to find out what was actually said to them and what their knowledge of the information is now. And those, those are names that, 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 I mean, that list can be added to almost every time these conversations are had. Don Hale, uh, investigative journalist, author of A Town Without Pity, about his work with Stephen Downing, the victim of probably the longest miscarriage of justice in British history.